I grew up in an era before there were smartphones and apps and games and texting and all the communication that we can do online. And I grew up with what I thought was way better than what we have today. But, <laughs> but it introduced me to the allure of the screen. Because what I grew up with was this thing right here. The Nintendo Entertainment System. How many of you had a Nintendo Entertainment System? When I, <laughs> about half the room, all right. So you know what I'm talking about. That introduced me to the, the, the screen, right? The trance that you can get when you play any kind of video games, right? My mom would just say, Matt, Matt, it's time for dinner, it's time for dinner. And I completely did not hear her, right? You just get in this trance when it comes to screens. I remember when, uh, you know, having conversations with my mom about screen time. Parents, that is, that's not just with this generation of kids. That's been going on for a long time. And I remember one specific conversation, my mom was like, you're just playing too many videos too long. You're spending too much time on watching TV and playing video games. And I said, again, I was maybe 10 years old. This was like 1987 when we had this. I said in response to that was, yeah, I get that, mom. But what about all the hours I'm not playing video games? How come you never affirm that? you know, the 22 hours of the day. And I'm sure she was like, man, these video games are messing with your brain. I also remember going to the doctor. I was just getting a checkup. And the doctor literally said, he looked at me and he said, again, I was like 10, 11 years old. He said, oh, I see you have Nintendo-itis. And he grabbed this and said, you have Nintendo-itis. Because I was a little bit chubby at the time. And he said, you know, this is a true story. He said, you know, you're getting a little bit chubby from playing too many video games. That's fat shaming, isn't it? I did not appreciate that, even as a kid. <laughs> if you are 18 or older, <laughs> you have and are living through what I would suggest is the biggest social disruption in America and really the, all around the world. We have transition from an industrial age to a digital age. And the digital age and the digital world, I would say, is still very disorienting. And so as we continue our conversation on unobvious idols, today we're going to address screens. And screens would include your phone, TV, uh, iPad, anything that has a screen. And the question that I want us to wrestle with today, and I hope that it's beyond a sermon, here's the key question. When does a screen stop being a tool and start becoming an idol? When does the screen stop being a tool and start becoming an idol? So if you have your phone, I just want you to grab it, pull it out if you're not looking at it right now. Just grab your phone if you have it. If you don't have one, that's okay. You're probably more dialed in today than the rest of them anyway. And the question I have for you is, are you holding your phone or is your phone holding you? <laughs> are you ruling your phone or is your phone ruling you? How do we cross the line from technology enhancing our lives to it ruling over us. Where is that line? Go ahead, you can put the phone away. Unless you're taking notes on it, you can put your phone away. Now, just to be clear, I am not against technology. I'm literally preaching from an iPad. So I'm not against technology. I'm very intrigued by AI, chat GPT. I think they can be an amazing tool. I think the communication we have, the access to information and knowledge it is an amazing advancement in our human history, really. But we have to guard against what can happen is when technology crosses that line is when it absorbs our time and attention and affections more than God. Amen. When it controls us instead of us controlling it. Yeah. So we're in this series called Unobvious Idols. And I want to remind you again what an idol is. An idol is anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything we look to 
a thing that we look to to give us something that only God can give. So idolatry then is not just a failure to obey God. Idolatry is setting our whole heart on something other than God, where we elevate a thing to be in the place where only God needs to be. And so the big idea today is screens can become an idol when their influence shapes our beliefs more than Christ. That's when they transition to being an idol. Now, I want to talk about the distractions of phones, screens, again, lumping in those all into the same category. What I've seen is there are two key reasons for constant engagement with screens. FOMO and FOBU. <laughs> now, you probably have heard of FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. It's also known as FOBLO, fear of being left out. And it can cause anxiety about from missing out on what is happening. Of course, social media amplifies all of that. How many of you deal with FOMO? Yeah, I do sometimes. But I deal way, way more with FOBU. Have you ever heard of FOBU? Probably not, because I think I just invented it <laughs> this week. But FOBU is the fear of being uninformed. And I struggle with this a lot more. Fear of being uninformed. So it creates this constant need to be updated, whether it's the news or texts or social media. And it's like, I just want to know. I want to be in the, I don't want to be uninformed about things. So I just want to stay, uh, you know, this endless cycle of checking and scrolling and consuming. And what it can lead to is this addiction of just digital updates. And so this constant engagement with screens that's when it can be a very powerful influence on our lives. So, do you have FOMO, FOMO, or FOBU? <laughs> now, while the Bible doesn't specifically address screens, I want to show you today that it does address algorithms. Now, you might be wondering what are algorithms? Are we going to get into a lesson in calculus? No. But we are, if you're online, you are influenced by algorithms. And what algorithms are, they're really a mirror. They reflect what you already like online. And so it's not because there's these big bad people in Silicon Valley that are, you know, just sending you all this stuff. Really, your algorithm is built by what you already like. It's meant to personalize your news feed or your social media feed. And so that's why your feed, what you see in the news, is going to be different than the person right next to you. It's going to be based on where you spend your time and attention, what you like, what you share. What can happen is, there's a phone that went off. <laughs> what can happen is it creates an echo chamber where you only see one side of a worldview. And if that's where you spend the majority of your time, it can so easily distort your worldview. So algorithms are not inherently evil, but they will influence you, and we must be aware of that. Now, you might be wondering, okay, how does the Bible address this? Well, this is where I want to go to 2 Timothy. We're going to stay in this book today. 2 Timothy chapter 4 now, the Apostle Paul, he's writing 2 Timothy as a letter to Timothy, who he is mentoring as a pastor. Paul is in prison, and his execution is imminent. So he writes this letter, and he's urging Timothy as, as you know, the, the person who's going to carry on the pastoral and the, the work of the ministry. He's urging Timothy to stay faithful to the gospel, persevere through suffering, continue preaching the message of Jesus. So he writes this letter to him. So I want us to pay attention to what Paul is writing and how it's relevant to us today. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse, verse 1. Paul writes, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Listen to this. For a time is coming 
when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching, they will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Or in our modern language, chase after conspiracy theories. So Paul gives some pretty strong warning in this passage. Where people will start to search for things they, they're going to meet their, what their itching ears want to hear. And to me, it's, it's so, so much reflects an algorithm. The more you like, it's like the more you're on that and you just get fed the same things. So he gives us some warnings, and I want to give you three warnings from Paul. Again, he's writing to Timothy, but I believe these warnings are relevant for us today. And the first warning is, I'd encourage you to write this down. The warning is that people will seek teachers who tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. He points out that people will stop listening to sound teaching. You know what that implies? That at one time they did listen to sound teaching, but now they're not. Which tells me these are not atheists that he's talking about. These are not Satanists, evil, wicked people who are you know, completely the opposition to what God is doing. These are people who at one point listened to sound teaching and now they're not because they're just wanting to hear what their itching ears want to hear. He said it's going to start by them following their own desires. And it's so important that we don't follow our own desires. You know why? Because our desires change. I used to hate Brussels sprouts. Now I love them. <laughs> you might say, oh, that's just taste buds. No, that's desires. Desires change. I used to like the Eagles, and now I don't anymore. <laughs> That is not very popular in this <laughs> church. But think about how your desires have changed through the years. Paul said they had started following their own desires, and then they started to seek teachers who would just tell them what they want to hear. That tells me it's very subtle. It's not very obvious. And they will reject truth and chase after myths. Very strong warning. But I want you to see there's more warnings that Paul gives. Number two, that people will become increasingly selfish. They will turn away from God and seek their own pleasure instead of godly living. So I want to just back up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because I want you to see how strong Paul is. And again, these are like his, his words of encouragement to Timothy. He knew these were like some of the last words he would give him. Here's what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.1. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will, only, will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Just think about any online activity that you've seen that matches up with this. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like this. Again, Paul is talking about these were people that act religious. They might look religious. These aren't people who are trying to get you to do satanic rituals. But he said, pay attention to that they will become increasingly selfish and stay away from people like that. Verse six says, they are the kind who work their way into people's homes. Think about the access digital has given us into people's homes. 
They work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. I don't know why Paul just calls out women on this, because I think men are just as susceptible. These teachers opposed the truth just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. But everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. Paul gives a warning that there are going to be people who become increasingly selfish, self-centered, following their own pleasures, their own desires, and it's going to lead to all of this, uh, these specific traits that he calls out. It's a warning to us not just to not do that, but to stay away from people like that. Don't let them be influences in your life. And then he says, there's going to be false teachers. Number three, another warning. There's going to be false teachers who deceive others. He, he gives two examples of that. But I also want you to see Jesus called out the same thing. There will be false teachers. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. You, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In other words, when you look at them at face value, these false teachers or false prophets, they're going to look like gentle, harmless sheep. You're not going to be able to tell if they're vicious wolves, that they're false prophets, that they're trying to intentionally deceive. But he says, be very careful, be aware of it. And the way that you can beware if they're false prophets or not not just to listen to what they say, but to look at how they act. Look at what they do. Be discerning. Not every voice that you hear online has your best interests at heart. And too many people have allowed these voices to speak into their lives and they don't know them personally. And I'm not saying that you can't hear or listen or learn from people that you don't know personally. I would just say be very cautious if you don't know them personally. Just be very discerning. There is a lot of false gospel, false teaching out there that looks like Christianity, but it's not. So let's make this personal to our online life. Take these warnings to heart. Here's a couple questions to think about. Number one, Are you seeking voices that tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear? Number two, are you using your phone or your screen as an escape? Is it your go-to when you just want to unplug? Number three, are you aware of false teachers online? Misleading information. I think the church must be very discerning. The church must be very aware. False false prophets, false teaching. Take these warnings to heart. Now, Paul does give us wisdom of how to be discerning. Because you might be wondering, okay, well, how do we be, how, how can we be more discerning? Well, Paul teaches us discernment and discipline And I think we can apply it to a digital life. So let's keep reading in verse 10, 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. It says, but you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. This is so powerful because he's pointing back to Paul saying, you didn't just hear what I taught You saw how I lived this out. And it builds credibility in Paul's message. He continues, he said, you know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What a promise to hold on to. (laughs) 
But evil people and imposters will flourish. Just think about that, the difference. Paul's saying, look, I, want, I don't want you to be surprised by this. He, if you're a godly person, you're going after a godly life, you will suffer persecution while at the same time you're going to see evil and wicked people look like they're flourishing. Don't be surprised by that. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. Again, I just want you to see the correlation between the message that you listen to and how much you know the person who's teaching it. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. This, I believe, is one of the most powerful verses of speaking to what we do in kids' ministry as well as parents, how you can instruct your children. When we pour in God's word and plant those seeds, it's gonna anchor them from childhood. He said, you've been taught these holy scriptures from childhood and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in him. It's anchored him all these years. And Paul, Paul is pointing back to it, the power of scripture. And then he wraps up this all up by saying, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach, what is, teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, I recognize that you can get scripture from a screen and you can get good teaching from a screen. But we must be discerning for what those influences are. So I wanna give you just a couple practical steps. Again, we're talking specifically about screens. How do we build this wisdom of discernment and discipline into our lives? Number one, choose your online mentors carefully. So I would just encourage you to ask yourself, who are the voices shaping your thinking? What podcasts are you listening to? YouTube videos, audiobooks, email subscriptions. Who have you allowed to speak into your life? Just pay attention to who you've allowed it into this. Choose those very carefully. It's very easy, and I found, I've done this many times. You watch one video on YouTube, and it just, you know, the algorithm gives you another one, and then another one, and soon. You're just going down into a rabbit hole. So choose your online mentors carefully. Are you learning more from social media influencers or from trusted spiritual mentors who you know? Number two, listen to sound teaching, not selfish desires. The Bible is our anchor Amen. in a world full of distractions. Let God's word anchor you. Paul said there's going to be a time where people reject truth and chase after myths. Let's be a people who reject myths and chase after truths. And here's just a good rule of thumb, a good reminder. If you're on social media, don't share anything on social media unless you have verified it that it is 100% true. You would stake your life on it. And you might be saying, but I don't know if there's anything I could share with that level of certainty. Well, maybe just don't share anything on social media. <laughs> but do you know why it's so important to not spread misinformation? Because as followers of Jesus, God's word calls that bearing false witness. And one of the Ten Commandments says, don't bear false witness. Do you know what happens when followers of Jesus bear false witness? We lose our credibility. And we lose our credibility to be a witness for Jesus, which is where it really matters. 
So listen to sound teaching. Let's reject myths, chase after truth. And then finally, number three, we're going to get really practical. When it comes to your screen, parent your screen. You know, screens are like pirates. They're like time thieves. They can so easily hijack your time and attention. Man, I've, I've done this way too many times. You know, at the end of a day, I'm tired, and it's like, I just want to start scrolling and start reading stuff, and I'm just hoping that I find something interesting. And then like 15 minutes goes by, and then 30 minutes, and then 45, and it's like, what am I doing with my life? Our kids called, call that brain rotting. That, not when I do that. They call it when they do that. <laughs> Their brain just begins to rot. But again, let's guard against these pirates that try to steal our time and attention because that's such a precious commodity. It's a limited resource. Technology can influence us, forms us. It can also deform us without us even realizing it. Parent your screen. You want a couple... Uh, Practical suggestions, you can take these or leave them. Parent your screen, number one, that means set boundaries. Not just of your kids' devices, if you're parents, that's important to do, set boundaries for your kids, but set boundaries on your own device. Parent your device. You know what that means? That means decide when your, your phone goes to bed. And decide when it wakes up in the morning. And maybe throughout the day, you need to give it some naps <laughs> where you just put it away. Now, I realize we use our technology for work and work responsibilities, but I'm, talking, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we go to our phones to just scroll mindlessly or to check on something, or maybe it's driven by a fear of being uninformed or missing out. If you don't set limits, your screen will rule your day, just will. Another suggestion is to turn off all notifications. Notifications have a way to come in and steal your time and attention. For a lot of years, I would read my Bible on this iPad, and what would happen is I'm reading, I'm having my quiet time, and then a, a text notification would pop up, and I'd see who it was from, and then I'd read the first line, and all of a sudden, my mind would shift from reading God's Word to thinking about, oh, I wonder how I should respond to that. Or if it was an emergency, I'd have to weigh, should I respond to them now? Should I open it and respond? Or... Those notifications have a way of just disrupting your thoughts. So try turning them off. And you might say, well, maybe there's some, what about the people when it is an emergency and I need to know? Well, maybe there's some notifications that you need to let through. Your phones can, can uh, choose how to do that. You can assign it. But instead of just getting all these pop-ups of all different news headlines and notifications that come through, and I'd encourage you to try turning those off. Another one is to prune one thing for growth. Jesus said there's going to be, you know, a gardener, a good gardener will look at good branches and sometimes prune a good branch for the purpose of more fruit. What would it look like if you deleted an app for a time? even if it was a good app, but just as a decision you make for more growth. Maybe it's a news app, maybe it's a social media app, maybe it's a game, maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's a podcast. Anything that may not be a bad thing, but you wanna prune that and then replace that time and give your attention to something that's gonna feed your soul. Time of reflection. You know, more uh, over the past, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago, I, there are many times when I go for a walk or uh, a jog, walk our dogs, I would put my earbuds in and want to listen to a podcast. I'm like, oh, it's perfect. 30 minutes, I can listen to some kind of podcast. But recently, I've just started leaving my earbuds at home and just allowing the quiet and reflection and prayer to feed my soul. And it's been an amazing step just for my, keeping a, a sense of peace in my own mind and heart. I'd encourage you to do that. Prune one thing for growth. And then finally, just as a more of a general statement, prioritize God over screens. 
I, I saw someone write this. I'm not sure who, where it came from. But what if for every hour you spent on your screens, okay, not talking about work responsibilities, but every hour you spent on your screens, you spend at least 10 minutes in scripture and prayer. How would your perspective shift? How would your peace level change? And I get it, even as we're getting close to, you know, presidential election, it's like, man, I want to know what the latest news, and I'm just waiting for that next headline because it just seems like every day there's uh, another uh, interesting or unprecedented piece of news that we've never experienced before. So I get that there's this hunger to be in the know. But imagine if you just step back from that and the peace and the calm and allow the presence of God to, and his word to refresh your soul. Screens are tools. They're not inherently bad. They can be used for a lot of good. We use technology here at this church to get the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. But don't let them take the place of God in your life. Screens are powerful. They can have a positive influence, but they can also be a negative influence. And it's so subtle because we're, it's so accessible. So I want to give you a final challenge and then a moment of reflection today. What's one step you could take to disconnect from your screen and use that time to reconnect with God? And I want to give you just a time to think about this and put these three questions on the screen, on the screen for you to see. <laughs> but allow one of these questions, or maybe all three of them, not just to speak to you today, but this week. Number one, are you seeking voices that tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear? Number two, are you using your phone as an escape? Remember the olden days, you know, the come home from work and you're tired and so you read the newspaper. Today, it's so easy to, instead of doing that to just scroll. And it's like, ah, after a hard days of work, day's work, it's nice to just scroll and veg. But are you using it as an escape to keep you from being present where your feet are? And then number three, are you aware of false teachers online? I just continue to see so much false teaching online and I just would encourage you to be discerning. They're not gonna, it's not gonna look like evil teaching. Pay attention to the fruit. I wanna give you just a moment just to reflect on these and ask the Holy Spirit, what is one step you could take? And in case you're wondering, I had to do that this week when I was, as I was putting this together. So much about God's word was convicting my heart, looking at my own screen time practices because they evolve, they grow. So often they develop without us giving them much intention. And it's like, man, I want my attention and focus and time to be tuned in, dialed into what the spirit of God is saying to me in my life, in our family, in our home rather than just letting all the voices of the coming through our online devices so often bringing confusion and anxiety. So take a moment just to reflect what may the Spirit of God be saying to you. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for <clears throat> the truth that comes from your word, and that's the truth that's going to set us free. God, I pray for those who may be chasing after myths, but don't even realize it. Chasing after conspiracy theories, but don't even realize it. My words can't change anybody's heart, but your word can.
And I pray there be a hunger for truth, chasing after truth. God, I pray for those who may be finding us an escape into their phone. Escaping from difficult realities, escaping from challenging relationships, escaping from stress, pressure. God, I pray instead of choosing that, I pray that they would find relief from your word and from your presence, from the peace that comes from you. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Would you just keep your heads bowed for a moment? I don't want to dismiss without giving you an opportunity today. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. And Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, he said, repent of your sins, turn from your selfish ways, and follow me. But you know what Jesus didn't say? He didn't say, clean up your life first. Make sure your good works outweigh your bad works. You know, try to do better and then come follow me. He said, come as you are. But he laid out the cost of following him. And to giving up your own life, your own way of life. And choosing Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. And I think he's very... It's very important that before you make a decision to follow Jesus, you understand what the cost is. It's giving up your life. But when you make that decision and place your faith in Jesus who went to the cross for our sins to experience forgiveness for our sins, on the other side of that decision is the greatest level of peace, joy, and purpose that you can ever experience this side of heaven. That's why I want you to make this decision. Because I want you to know that God is for you. He's not against you. I want you to know that he's made a pathway for freedom, forgiveness. But it starts with that decision that you surrender to him. <clears throat> Believe in your heart that Jesus, when he went to the cross, it was for, to pay this debt of sin that we could not pay. And so if you're ready to make that decision, I wanna lead you in a prayer. I'm just gonna invite you to repeat it out loud. And I'm gonna invite everyone to pray just so nobody's praying alone. So would you say this? Would you say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he came to this earth, died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and rose from the dead for me. He ascended to heaven, and he will return again as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I repent of my sins, turn from my selfish ways, and I choose Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. The power of the gospel is so powerful, it can transform a human heart. And so if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you know you need to make that decision today, the ushers have a Bible for you that we'd love for you to have. Would you have the courage to just put your hand up in the air, unashamed of this decision, until an usher sees you and they hand you that Bible? And I want you to know you're not alone. We have people respond this morning at the 9 a.m. service. So you're not alone making this decision. And then after the service, I want to invite you to stop by our connections rooms on either side of the auditorium. We have a team of people there that would love to talk with you and pray with you, walk with you. This journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone. Hey, I saw at least one hand go up. Can we thank God for those who made decisions today? Once you make a decision to follow Jesus, your next step is to be water baptized. It's for you. It's not for the church. It's for you to put that line in the sand where you're saying, I'm following Jesus all in, no turning back. If you'd like to be water baptized, you can sign up online, worshipcenter.org slash baptism. We'd love to help you. It's a class you go through to understand uh, kind of the basics of what it is to follow Jesus. So it's very, very good. I hope you can uh, take that step.
All right, well, so good to be together. If you need prayer for any reason, we'll have a prayer team down front. Please feel free to come. If you're new to Worship Center, make sure you stop by. Uh, you can go ahead and stand. Make sure, if you're new to Worship Center, make sure you stop by Connections. And don't forget, you are God's masterpiece. You've been created on purpose for an incredible purpose. Go out this week, passionately pursue the purpose God has in your life. Be amazed at what God can do through you. Have a great rest of your day. See you here next Sunday.